They that know the name, thy name will put their trust in thee. Let's turn to number 410. 410. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. <clears throat> 410. Number 459 is leaning on the everlasting arms. Let's go, let's all stand as we sing, leaning on the everlasting arms. 459. dismissed to children's to something what is it we walkers weed whackers all right <laughs> let's take a moment to shake each other's hands <laughs>
verse 2. Oh, sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, say that As we get to the chorus on the last verse, let's uh, let's just let the piano drop out and let's all sing together. Okay, ready and. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting heart. secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, ladies. I grew up with that song, okay? It goes back many years to Belvedere, that song. I think Sandy, my wife Sandy, used to sing that song with a girl named Diane Linder in the Baptist Church. And sometimes the Baptist Church in Belvedere would have singspiration after the evening services in their churches, separate churches, the Baptist Church, it used to be called South 
Baptist church because it was on the south side of the river, not because it was a Southern Baptist church. And then uh, Pastor Procknell came in the probably early 60s, and he changed the name to Calvary Baptist Church. So they changed from South Baptist Church, the same building, same church. And uh, if you know anything about Belvedere, you're, there is uh, South State Street and Logan Avenue. Logan Avenue goes east, and South State goes back toward, used to be Route 5, now it's called Bypass 20. And right on that Y of Logan Avenue and South State, used to be a Penny's building, J.C. Penny's, okay? And right to the left of that, or east, was a little law office, and right next to that <clears throat> was the South Baptist Church, right downtown. And then right next to that was Jack Wolf, not Jack Wolf, uh, Doc Wolf, uh, Chevrolet dealership. <clears throat> and so we were between the dealership and the Penny's, uh, South Baptist Church, <clears throat> and then in 1968, they started building over behind Pacemaker, the new Calvary Baptist building. And uh, I was talking to Randy Trueblood yesterday, uh, uh, an old timer uh, from the Baptist Church. And uh, he said in 1969, October the 26th of 1969, they moved, they had their first service in the brand new building in 1969. And so, uh, Sandy and I went to Bob Jones in 1968, and then Pastor Procknell had me come for a couple of summers as youth pastor for the teens in the early 70s, and Pastor Procknell left uh, Calvary Baptist Church and went to Macomb and pastored there, and after he left, uh, they had me come for the summer to be an interim pastor for three months before R.H. Hunt before Pastor Hunt came and pastored the church there for a while. So, and then in 19, that was in 19, the summer of 1974 that I was there for interim pastor. And, uh, and that's when we, we adopted Jessica in uh, April of April of 1st. Well, she, she was born April 1st of 74. And that summer we went to Belvedere and Sandy got that nine month flu in Belvedere and uh, in uh, April of 75, Janelle was born, and uh, I was or ordained in the summer of 75 at uh, Calvary Baptist Church of Belvedere, and uh, and we went, I started a ministry, didn't start a ministry, but I pastored a, a little Bible church in Greenwood, Mississippi for a year and a half. Uh, a week after I got there, the, pa the man said, well, we, re we, we really didn't call you as pastor. You're just an elder here. And so, oh, all right, well, why'd you call me as pastor? <clears throat> so we had a little head-butting there for a while, and uh, I worked in a cabinet shop in Greedwood, Mississippi for a while. And when we came to Peoria, and we were in Peoria for uh, two or three years from 77 to 79, and it was when we were in Peoria that Pastor Potter, Abby's father, had asked me to come and teach Bible doctrines at his church, at Calvary Baptist Church in Chillicothe, Illinois. And so we were there. Uh, I was teaching Bible doctrines for one year, uh, a fall through the summer, the spring of uh, 1980. And then in 1980, we moved to Hoopston, Illinois, all the way on the east side of the state. <clears throat> we, were from, we were in Hoopston from... 1980 to 1995, 15 years we were there, and then we moved. Uh, I resigned the ministry uh, there because of some issues with uh, some children, and so uh, then I started working at on-site woodwork in 1995, and was there for 17 years as a cabinet maker at on-site. In 2009, uh, the Lord, we had uh, some people at Calvary. There was some major issues there at Calvary, and so some, uh, a lot of people left Calvary, and they called me up and said, Wes, uh, would you be interested in ministering to us for a while? And so uh, we started in March of 2009, and we started, we, we met for a month at Holiday Inn in Rockford on East State Street down in the basement, and then uh, one of the ladies knew the people that ran the uh, 
Flora Grange on Stone Quarry Road in Belvedere. <clears throat> and so we met at the, just short of three years at the Flora Grange. And uh, we had a man come uh, that used to be at Calvary, and they lived in South Carolina. And he said, Wes, you made a big mistake by having your church out here at Flora Grange. Nobody's ever going to come out here. Well, he didn't know what he was talking about because we filled the building several times and uh, we had a really a great relationship with the people at the Flora Grange uh, for three years and uh, we bought some nice new padded chairs uh, for people to sit on. And the Flora Grange people loved that, that we had padded seats for them to sit on because they had the old metal chairs. And then they saw we, we made a mistake by <clears throat> leaving our statement of financial statement on, the, on a podium. And they saw that we had a sizable amount of money in our account. <clears throat> and uh, they said, I'll tell you, w would you be interested in uh, not paying us, uh, let's see, how was it? Uh, that we would give them a loan so they could have air conditioning in their Grange Hall. And so we said, we'll be glad to do that. And so uh, that just helped us uh, by having air conditioning because we had, a, it was out in, the, out in the country, okay? And on the, south side, on the north side of the building, they had uh, belted cattle. And if you know what the farm smells like, uh, <laughs> I was at home. I, I tell you what. I, I was more at home preaching in the Flora Grange, I think, than I ever, any church I've ever been in in my life. Because I was raised on a farm for eight years, first eight years of my life, and I loved the farm. And, and uh, so well, I didn't mean to give you that history. It has nothing to do with the message tonight. So <clears throat> but anyway, that's a little history of where we've been and our lives. And uh, so... And, and then, so we started, we started the, the Faith Baptist Church, so it's been, it's 10 years now. We, we got it together in, in 09. And something else that's interesting about this. In 1909, my great-grandfather helped start the Covenant Church in Belvedere. And 100 years later, I helped start Faith Baptist Church in Belvedere. Not too many people can say that. And I praise the Lord I can, but uh, that's neither here nor there. First, first Samuel chapter 30 is where we're beginning tonight. We're going to look there, and then we're going to look at Psalm 56. First Samuel chapter 30, and verses 1 to 6. First Samuel chapter 30, beginning in verse 1. And it came to pass when David... And his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city and behold, it was burned with fire and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. So, and, and David's two wives were taken captive, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife or the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed. For the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people were grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought hither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered, that is, the Lord answered, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. 
So David went, he and the 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Bezor, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued he and the 400 men, for 200 abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Bezor. Most of us know the scripture here that, <clears throat> and the scripture leading up to this passage of scripture, that King Saul was very jealous of David. It all started after when David killed Goliath. And the Israelites made up a little ballad or maybe a folk song. And uh, I don't know all the words, but it, went, it started like this. King Saul killed thousands of his Philistines but our David killed tens of thousands. And when Saul heard that, he got jealous of the young lad named David. Saul's jealousy grew toward David to the point that he tried to kill him on two separate occasions in the palace. And he even began, and he even began tracking him like an animal or like a fugitive or an enemy army. In, Saul, if in 1 Samuel 27, David reasoned in his heart like this in verse 1, Saul is out to kill me, and if I stay here, he will succeed. Therefore, I might as well flee from him, from his hand, and go and live in the area of the Philistines. Now, it doesn't tell us in 1 Samuel chapter 27 that David prayed about this matter. He just got afraid of King Saul and said, I'm, I'm going to get out of, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to hightail it out of here because he's, he's, he's going to succeed in killing me. So David took his 600 troops, their families, and all their possessions to Gath, a little town called Gath, a city 25 miles southwest of Jerusalem, and 20 miles inland from the Mediterranean Sea. A man by the name of Achish was the king of Gath. 1 Samuel 27, verse 5, David asked Achish, is there some outlying village where all of our troops and families can live? So, uh, we won't be, he, David didn't want him and his 600 troops and the families to be a burden there in that little town of, I don't know how big Gath was at the time, but didn't want to be a burden to the people of Gath and to the king. And in verse, verse 6, King Achish gave David and his troops the village called Ziklag, or a place of dwelling. Zik, Ziklag was located in southern Judah, going east and west, halfway between the Mediterranean Sea and the Dead Sea, about 17 miles southeast of Gath, and 12 miles north of Israel's southernmost city, Beersheba. 1 Samuel chapter 28. The Philistines gathered their armies together to fight against the Israelites, against King Saul. And King, King Achish said to David, you and your troops are going to go to battle with us as we go to fight King Saul. And David answered in 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 2, you know, you've no doubt heard what kind of a soldier and a warrior I am. And Achish says, yes, I have. And I want you to be the protector of my head until I die. I want you to be my uh, bodyguard, is what he's saying. Now, when King Saul saw the Philistines gathering their troops together, he became afraid. And so he prayed. And he asked the Lord, what's going to happen here in this battle? But the Lord didn't answer him because of Saul's sin. Because of his disobedience, the Lord would not answer Saul. Saul, still very much afraid, decided to go to the witch of Endor and ask the witch of Endor to do a seance because he wanted to talk to the prophet Samuel. So the witch of Endor brought up the prophet Samuel. 
And Samuel said to David, tomorrow your troops are going to be attacked by the Philistines and you're going to be smitten, you're going to be beaten, and you and your sons are going to die at the hands of the Philistines. Chapter 29 of 1 Samuel, the day of the battle between Israel and the Philistines, the Philistines continue to amass their troops together. And uh, in verse 2, toward the end of the companies, the Philistine soldiers is Achish, the king of Gath, and behind his troops is David and his 600 soldiers. Now when the Philistine leaders see David, an Israelite, and his 600 troops, the leaders of the Philistine armies are saying to Achish, what in the world are you doing? You don't have your head screwed on right, buddy. If we go to battle with the, the Israelites, and you've got some Israelite soldiers in your company here, in our company, when they see King Saul getting beaten and their comrades getting beaten, they're going to turn on us and they're going to fight against us. So the leaders of the Philistines told King Achish, you get rid of David and his troops. You send them home, which Achish did. Chapter 30, where we read this evening, David and his troops are now uh, discharged and are heading back to Ziklag the village where they were living, the village where their wives and children are. And as they approach the city, they see smoke. As they come up over the crest of the hill, they see no homes left in Ziglag. Everything is nothing but smoldering ruins. And as we read in our chapter, they lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. This was David and his men's response. And it says in verse 6 that David was greatly distressed at the loss of his home and his troops' home, that all the troops' wives and children were taken captive, and his men thought of stoning him, killing him. Stoning him. Now, I don't know if you've ever noticed <clears throat> what kind of men David's troops were, his 600 men. But uh, I've done a little research on it. And in 1 Samuel 22, verse 2, it states that his troops were men in distress and in debt and discontent. They were not the most exemplary soldiers to have in your army. 1 Samuel 30, this same chapter, verse 22, states that some of his soldiers were wicked men, sons of Belial. I did a cross-reference to the, that term, sons of Belial, and Deuteronomy 13, verse 13, states that children of Belial were idol worshippers. It, dirt, it certainly doesn't sound like David's army were well disciplined. But they were not men of faith. They were not men of great character. I would call them a kind of a ragtag army. I want us to think today, this evening, on what David did when he was distressed. It says at the end of the verse, verse 6, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Now when you and I get discouraged or distressed, we will do any number of things. We will encourage ourselves in self-pity. Oh, woe is me. Nobody has it worse than me. We will do that. 
or we will encourage ourselves in a martyr's complex. Well, you might know how that's how they're going to treat Christians. Or we might encourage ourselves to give up. I quit. I'm out of here. Or we might encourage ourselves in looking for a person who faced similar circumstances. Or we will encourage ourselves by blaming others for the problems that, and the mistakes that we might have caused ourselves. But David did none of these things. It says he encouraged himself in the Lord. Now, if you want to hold your finger here in 1 Samuel 30, let's move over to Psalm 56. <clears throat> That's where we're going to spend the rest of our time this evening. Psalm 56. <clears throat> what does it mean to encourage yourself in the Lord? And I think Psalm 56 gives us some answers to what it means to encourage yourself in the Lord. Psalm 56 describes David in distress... And David encouraging himself in God. The first thing that David did to encourage himself in the Lord was to pray. <clears throat> Psalm 56, verse 1, verses 1 and 2. He says, Be merciful unto me, O God. Now I'm in Psalm 56. Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. He fighting daily oppresseth me. Mine enemies would daily swallow me up. For they be many that fight against me, O thou most high. It has described the book of Psalms as sighing turned into singing through praying. I think one of the reasons David got into predicament he did in Ziklag because he didn't pray, Lord, should I go into the area of the Philistines with my troops? He didn't ask the Lord that. There's no indication that he prayed about if he should take his 600 troops and their families to the area of the Philistines. But when he was at the point of being stoned by his troops, 1 Samuel chapter 30, when they were discouraged, when they saw their families kidnapped, taken captive, become slaves to the Amalekites? Maybe he'd never see his fam their families again? Then he prayed. David prayed in one major crisis or another. David, in his heart, David in pours out his heart to the Lord. Verse 8. David inquired at the Lord, saying, this is back in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 8. David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he, referring to the Lord, answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. You know, some people have the idea it's not right for us as Christians to ever ask the Lord for anything for ourselves. Now, I don't know where they get that thought, because it's certainly not in the Bible. James 5, verse 13 says, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. David was afflicted. He was at the point of they're going to stone him. He was in distress. He prayed. 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. It's not wrong for us to pray for something and we have a need. We don't need to ask for something we have a want, but if we have a definite need, pray. <clears throat> Richard Trent, a great theologian of bygone years, wrote this sonnet. Lord, what a change within us one short hour spent in thy presence will avail to make. What heavy burdens from our bosoms take, what parched grounds refresh as with a shower. We kneel and all around us seem to lower, 
we rise in all the distant and the near, stands forth in sunny outline, brave and clear. We kneel, how weak, we rise, how full of power. Why, therefore, should we do ourselves this wrong or others that we are not always strong, that we are sometimes overborne with care, that we should ever weak or heartless be, anxious or troubled when with us is prayer and joy and strength and courage are with thee? When you face distress or a major crisis in your life, do you pray? One of my favorite hymns on prayer is entitled, Did You Think to Pray? And uh, it's written by a Mrs. M.A. Kidder. <clears throat> and I asked the Kidder clan in Belvedere, is that any relation to you folks? And uh, one of Andy's, Andy Kidder, Janelle's husband's aunts, is uh, Janet Monroe, and she's kind of a family historian, and she looked it up, and it's some distant relative to the David Kidder family that used to live in Belvedere, and they're from Spooner, Wisconsin. This is how it reads. Now, I can't sing, so I'm going to read it. To you. Did you think to pray? Ere you left your room this morning, did you think to pray? In the name of Christ our Savior, did you sue for loving favor as a shield today? Oh, how praying rests the weary. Prayer will change the night today. So in sorrow and in gladness, don't forget to pray. When you met with great temptation, did you think to pray? By his uh, dying love and merit, did you claim the Holy Spirit as your guide and stay? When your heart was filled with anger, did you think to pray? Did you plead for grace, my brother, that you might forgive another who had crossed your way? When sore trials came upon you, did you think to pray? When your soul was bound in sorrow, balm of Gilead did you borrow at the gates of day. Oh, how praying rests the weary. Prayer will change the night to day. So in sorrow and in gladness, don't forget to pray. The first thing David did to encourage himself in the Lord when he was in great distress was he prayed. The second thing David did when, when he was discouraged, he trusted the Lord. Psalm 56, verse 3. What time I am afraid... I will trust in thee. Verse 4, the second part of the verse, in God have I put my trust. Verse 9, the second part of verse 9, this I know, for God is for me. Wow, is that not trust? God is for me. <clears throat> verse 11, in God have I put my trust. Trust is the Old Testament word for faith. Faith is taking God at His word. Faith is believing what God says. Now in Genesis 22, Abraham trusted God when God told him to go and sacrifice his son on an altar at Mount Moriah. Job trusted God in that Messiah would come and that he, Job, would one day see the Messiah standing on this earth. David trusted God's guidance to pursue after the Amalekites to recapture their families. So when God told David to pursue and that he would recover all Every troop's wife would be recovered. Every troop's children would be saved. All their belongings would be recaptured and brought back to Ziklag. David trusted the Lord to go 
and recapture the families. Oliver Cromwell was a prime minister in England. And one of his officers was given to the sin of worry. Hmm, sounds like me and maybe some of you. One day a godly servant who knew him, who knew how to live in today and leave tomorrow to the care of his Lord said to this worrisome officer, Master, the Lord ran this world before you came into it. To which the Master quickly agreed. You expect him to run it after you leave it, do you not? Again, the worrisome officer agreed. Then how much better would it be to let him and trust him to run it while you are in it here and now? That would be wise for us, wouldn't it? Trust God's wisdom to guide Trust his goodness to provide. Trust his saving love and power. Trust him every day and hour. Trust him as the only light. Trust him in the darkest night. Trust in sickness. Trust in help. Trust in poverty and wealth. Trust him living, dying too. Trust him all your journey through. David trusted the Lord. In a time of great, great and dire need, are you trusting the Lord to help you? The third thing that David did to encourage himself in the Lord was to praise God and to praise his word. Psalm 56, verse 4, A. In God I will praise his word. Skip down to verse 7. In God will I praise his word in the Lord. Will I praise his word? David said in Psalm 42, verse 5, I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. In Psalm 18, verse 2, the Lord, David praised the Lord this way, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Listen to what David said in Psalm 33, verses 1 to 4. Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is calmly for the upright. Praise the Lord with harp. Sing unto him with the psaltery and with an instrument of ten strings. Sing unto him a new song. Play skillfully with a loud voice. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. At least 16 psalms are entitled Songs of Praise. My favorite Bible example of singing praise to the Lord is found in the New Testament, Acts chapter 16. <clears throat> Paul and Silas are in Philippi, and they're preaching the word on the streets of Philippi. And there was a man who had a slave girl and this slave girl was demon-possessed. And this slave girl would follow Paul and Silas and tell how these men were men of God. They were, this girl was mocking, this demon, this demon was mocking Paul and Silas for their ministry. And so Paul and Silas turned around and cast the demon out of this girl. And it says there in that passage that the owner of that girl, the master of that girl, had Paul and Silas beaten and thrown in jail, thrown in prison. Now, prison is not the most pleasant place. It can be dirty and stinky, and the clientele in prison aren't the most enjoyable people to be around. When I was a student at Bob Jones, we would go to Lawrence, South Carolina, and we'd go to the county jail, and a nursing home, and a chain gang. And we would minister on Sunday mornings to those different, in those different places. 
And so I've been in some jails, and I've been in some prisons, and I've been in... Uh, I, I, got, I didn't have any problems about going to these places, but one time I got locked in with the prisoners. And that was a little bit different scenario. <laughs> well, anyway, Paul and Silas were beaten and thrown in jail. I've never been beaten by someone other than I, I've been spanked a few times, <clears throat> but uh, never been beaten. And I can't imagine the suffering that they were probably going through. But it says in Acts 16, verse 25, at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises to God. Scores of times in the Bible, men and women of faith in times of distress encouraged themselves in the Lord by singing the praises and the promises of God. When you face distress and problems and trials and troubles and discouragement, can you sing praise to the Lord? On October the 8th, 1932, my father's, my father's mother was dying. Her name was Anna Johnson Halstead. She died on the Woodstock Road in the home, but what we call the home place on the Woodstock Road there in Boone County. And she gathered together, the family gathered together, 11 children and her husband, Sigurd. And uh, <clears throat> she sang this song the night she passed away. I don't know how many verses she sang, but it wasn't until 1947 that this song was translated into English. So she sang this song from a Swedish hymn, hymnal the night she passed away. The title is, Why Should I Be Anxious? And it was written by a Swedish man named Nils Frickman in 1879. It goes like this. Why should I be anxious? I have such a friend. His heart all my woe. This friend is the Savior, on him I depend, his love is eternal, I know. Though I am unworthy, he chose even me, by grace in his kingdom to dwell. That grace so abundant my refuge will be, thy goodness, thy goodness, O God, I will I would tell. His mercy I know is sufficient for me. And therein my soul finds its peace. He chastens with love, ever patient is he. My joys through his blessing increase. Each day he is near me, he walks by my side. His strength never fails as does mine. In glory with him I at last shall abide. For that is his promise divine. The power of hell holds no, no terror for me. My stronghold is Israel's God. In trial and in sorrow, my refuge is he. O Savior, thy mercy I laud. Thus onward I go to that wonderful land, that beautiful home of the blessed. Storms rage in fury. I'm safe in his hand. I'll enter the haven of rest. Can we praise God even in times of trial and distress? David did. There's one other thought I want to share this evening. The fourth thing David did to encourage himself in the Lord when distressed was he did not fear man. Psalm 56, verse 4, the last part of the verse. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Verse 11. The second part of the verse, I will not be afraid of what man can do unto me. <clears throat> In Psalm 118, verse 6, the Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do unto me? David's trust in the Lord outweighed his fear in man. In Genesis 32, Jacob is returning to his homeland 20 years after he fled his home because Esau was ready to kill him. Remember, 
Jacob had stolen Esau's birthright. Stolen the blessing, I should say, the, the blessing. He, Esau sold his birthright to Jacob for a mess of pottage, uh, lentils, and uh, now he's, he went and got the blessing from his father, and Esau's out to kill him. But now in Genesis 32, Jacob is returning with his wives and with all of his children. And Jacob sends his servants to announce to his brother Esau that he's returning home. And the servants return to Jacob with a report that 400 men are coming with Esau to meet you. Maybe not to greet you, but to meet you. It says in Genesis 32, verse 7, that Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. In Genesis 32, verse 9, we read this, And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which said unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, I will deal well with thee. Oh. What is Jacob doing? He's claiming a promise from the Lord. The Lord said, Jacob, it's time for you to go back home. And Jacob gave him a promise. Go on home, and I'm going to deal well with you. You're going to get the land that I promised to your father, to your father's father. You're going to get that land, and everything is going to be okay. In this same chapter, Genesis 32, we read in verses 24 to 32 that Jacob wrestles with an angel. Jacob is encouraging himself in the Lord through prayer. Jacob's trust in the Lord's promise overshadows his fear of Esau and possible death to Jacob. We have, a, we have a passage, a, a verse of scripture in Hosea, chapter 12 and verse 4. And there, in, in, I'm going to read you a footnote from Ryrie's study Bible. This is the footnote. The man who wrestled with Jacob is called an angel in Hosea 12, verse 4, and was evidently the pre-incarnate Christ. Jacob's wrestling involved agonizing prayer. His wrestling with the angel is involving agonizing prayer. And what's he come out of that after that agonizing prayer? He's trusting God's promise instead of fear of Esau. There was a Scottish preacher named John McNeil who tells of an experience that he had when he was a little boy. And his parents sent him to town to do an errand. And he kind of lollygagged in town a little bit too long because it started getting dark before he started back home. And he had to walk six or seven miles through a woods to get home. The night was very dark and the road had a bad reputation he says, in the, deep, in the uh, deepest of the darkness, there suddenly rang out a great, strong, cheery voice. Is that you, Johnny? It was my father, the bravest, strongest man I ever knew. And McNeil goes on to say, many a time since then, since when things have been getting very black and gloomy about me, I have heard a voice much greater than any earthly father. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. David was greatly distressed at seeing his home and the homes of all of his troops burned to the ground. Every woman and child taken captive by the Amalekites. And all their earthly possessions were gone. 
Their homes burned to the ground. He did not know if he would ever see his family, any of the families again, any of the wives or any of the children. But David encouraged himself. He strengthened himself in the Lord even while he was distressed and while he was grieved. He prayed. He trusted in the Lord. He praised God and his word. And he did not, and he did not fear man. Christian friend, when it seems as though your family is falling apart, when it seems as though your family is forsaking you, when it seems as though your family is feuding, when your health is failing and loved ones are, are, are passing on, your financial pressures are mounting up, in these times of distress and grief and turmoil, this is the very time to encourage yourself in the Lord. Bring the matter to the Lord in prayer. Once you pray, trust the Lord to meet your need. Have faith in the Lord and His answer to your prayer. Next, claim the promises of God's Word and sing the praises of the Lord. And finally, faith needs to be stronger, strong enough that it overshadows your fear of people. Trust the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this evening. We thank you for the promises of your word. We thank you for the steps that David took to encourage himself in the Lord. And Lord, help us just to be reminded of these things this evening and help us to put these, pra these steps into practice that we will be encouraged and strengthened and growing in Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.